photography works in lots of different ways. It's like infinite and I'm still exploring all that. That's my job, that's what I do. I was always on the street taking pictures and kids got to know me. They'd always be saying, take our picture. I became known as Photy Man because I was the one who took the photies. I know this book's gonna happen, and I'd like one more shot to do a sustained amount of work in Ireland, just to photograph solidly, to, to try and pull loose ends together. We're at the Farmer's Mart in Ballinano, which is the biggest town probably in, in Mayo. Uh, God bless you, God bless you. How will I get it to you? If I leave it in the mart, yeah, yeah, you want to come yeah, back yeah. in the spring? Yeah. They'll give it to you, won't they? Yeah. Well, God bless you. Certainly the, the, the kind of older farmers who still have one foot in the old ways, they're disappearing and they're, um, whatever the spirit there is about them, um, uh, I'd like to catch a bit of that. In fact, you know, I don't think, uh, and in, in a way that um, wasn't a cliché documentary shot. I'm interested, I suppose, there's a fellow now coming through the door who's maybe 75 with a stick. And he's speaking to some of the other farmers. My response would be to get up and take a picture of him. <laughs> so, there you go. That's the situation where we're strangers, um, and the guy walks in and says, don't take pictures of me. I'm Irish, I was born here. I was born in near you Cross Malina. I know, I had, I, had, I had an Irish accent. Well, you speak like where I was, and you're a Norwegian. Like a Norwegian, yeah, probably. <laughs> so I, I, had, I had an Irish accent when I was a boy, for sure. Yeah. I had a Catholic mother, Protestant father, and, and we ended up going to England, but oh, I always right. came back every summer for the holidays, you know, oh, and right. took pictures. Oh, yeah. And now they're going to make a book. But I'm 90 years. You're not. I am 90 years. And, uh, I mean, you <laughs> Wasn't that fantastic? You fantastic. Couldn't dream I knew when he was fascinated, he was the right man for you. Yeah, couldn't pick up another Unbelievable. Man. The older I've got, I'd say the more pictures I take and the easier it is to do it. So when I was stood up there with the auctioneer, you know, I, I know which lens I've got on there. All the time the camera is, is just down here at my waist or at my chest, I'm still taking pictures. You know, if I raise it to my eye, that might change the situation. But the little, all those little gestures and stuff, you know, that's going on between those guys, I'm interested in that. Um, so it could be there in one frame, you know, the way the guy look, looks up to the, the auctioneer, those little things. That, that's the kind of dance thing you're doing. I can make 50 pictures around an interesting scene, and 48 are OK, have interesting things with them, but don't live, don't work. But one or two may go, you know, something else happens. I could easily come here every week for years, easily. It'd give something back as well in the end, that would be great.
because I didn't drive. I spent a lot of time on buses every day. By way of exploring Merseyside, I would take pictures. So uh, I began that in 1978 and carried on doing it till I left Merseyside. So that's like over 20 years um, of pictures. You couldn't jump off the bus and ask someone's permission. So you just had to take it. That's all part of the, the whole learning process of doing candid pictures. You're moving along very fast. Uh, it's fractions of seconds, and uh, if you think about it, it's gone. I used outdated cine film because it was very cheap. From about 1989, I used all colour. I spent my life doing that, that's just normal, but uh, sometimes it's two hours or whatever. And the journey becomes part of the whole working process. And then you get off somewhere and you've already been working and that momentum carries you through the day. And you do the same on the way back. Off to uh, Hickson's, the oldest drapery store in Cross Malina. I've been going in there for years, taking pictures in there. I remember this, this store when I was a child and coming back and going in here and buying stuff. Um, yeah. And then when I, I came back first in 1975, oh, yes. I met Tom Hickson and he was just such a, an interesting character. Oh, very much, yeah. Uh, and he had all this wonderful, um, this wonderful shop full of clothes that seemed to go back 50 years. And then I couldn't find maybe something that, that would suit me, would be correct, and he would disappear upstairs and come down <laughs> with like three versions of whatever it was. Now, I don't expect anything here, Geraldine, but over the years, I always said, I said to you about Mr. Hickson, I'd love to look upstairs where he used to go and bring all this stuff down. Oh, I'm sure know. it's just empty up there and you wouldn't want me to look, but I'd love to look up there. It's, um, it's it just in very bad uh, condition, condition at the moment. It's I'm just, sure. you know, because um, I don't use that part. Is there the anything up there, though? I mean, I'd just love to see. Could I go and have a look without a camera? Just leave the camera and just have a look. I suppose you could. Now look at this. This is unbelievable. You know, this is it. This is just amazing. This is a piece of art in itself, this one shot, just looking there. Those bunch of shoes over there is incredible. In the other rooms, you wouldn't believe what's in the other rooms. Everywhere here is, is, is just, it's great. It's really good, just as exciting as, as uh, the landscape outside. It's amazing to be up here after all these years. I can't believe this. It's uh, every, everywhere, every arrangement looks like uh, I should be taking a picture of it. And the fact I liked Mr. Hickson so much to come up here and see all this stuff is, is really sad, but at the same time, uh, I don't know. Um, I think it's amazing. I mean, I've been to places like this for so many years, uh, you know, someone would emigrate and you'd, you'd, you'd see this empty house in the middle of nowhere full of all this stuff that no one wanted. And um, I photograph those kind of places a lot. <laughs> really. I lived in this, this one small place called New Brighton across the River Mersey from Liverpool. And one of the places I always went to was a market outside of town. And because it was out of town, there was no kind of false, you know, people would be there in the curlers or just, you know, really natural. And I went every Saturday and tried to photograph these women week after week, month after month. Catching the women, looking them in the eyes, seemed like a natural connection. But um, 
and I did it openly. I never used a long lens and hid behind a, a lamppost, you know? There's always a wide-angle lens, and I'm really close to them. But there's a picture called Three Wise Women, which was made not at the women's market, uh, but at a, a, a car boot sale. And uh, I'd go there every Sunday morning. I had a mate used to go there to, to buy stuff, and we would leave about half past five. I'd be on the gate as people came in to tell them that um, I wasn't trading standards, I wasn't, you know, uh, DHSS. Um, I was just doing this project for myself, and uh, so they wouldn't be scared and worried when they saw me later. to take pictures most of the time is easy and natural and good fun. When I'm out working, I'll have the camera on my shoulder if it's a large format or ready in my hand to, to use. Otherwise, if it's in a bag, you know, you have to take the lens cap off the stuff, you know, you think, ah, it's not interesting, I won't bother. You know, the whole key thing is, is to just to have a go. You know, and you start and that involves decisions and processes and one decision leads to another and suddenly you might get a good picture. A lot of people have spoke about how photography is the easiest of art forms. And then maybe that makes it the hardest. But it's, it's easy to get a good picture. And the second roll of film I ever shot was my best-selling picture, and I, I still like the picture. We're in a little town called Ballycastle in the west of Ireland, and there's an art centre here. Uh, this is my little studio, and um, I'm working on this Irish book, pictures which go back to the 70s. I lived here till I was about three years old. We emigrated um, and came back every summer to spend my summer holidays here. And then it was only when I came back as an art student in 75, I suddenly saw the whole place freshly. I began taking pictures. And now, 40 years later, unbelievably, the whole lot has been made into a book uh, alongside a book about Wales, North Wales, where I lived for 10 years, and a book about Liverpool. And that book, the theme was, I thought, was, was uh, landscape. But now I see all this Irish stuff here, and there's so many people in the pictures. Somehow, these pictures have, have, have um, ended up being in the book, which is pretty amazing to me, because I didn't select them. I worked with, with uh, three other ed editors. Uh, so this is their selection, and uh, these are just really all quality photocopies, work prints of the layout of the book. When I come back to Ireland, I'll be shooting video as well as taking stills. This picture here um, is, is from the video. My mother never came back to Ireland only for funerals. The reason my mother left Ireland was, was for, you know, due to religious intolerance. She was Catholic and she married a Protestant. And because of that, none of her family ever spoke to her again. So that's the story. So to have her in the, in the book, uh, her eyes and a bit of intensity coming across um, is pretty good. But again, I, you know, that's too close to me to put it in the book. But in fact, someone who doesn't know that story you know, has put it in the book. Um, that's great. Here's a, an early picture of my, my father, and he, he loved the land more than anything, but nevertheless he, he, uh, he left the land and moved to England. How you put a set of pictures together to add up to a lot more than um, the individual pictures is, is a whole other art form. I don't know what happens during that process. Uh, and that's the best thing, you know, finding pictures which uh, you, you, you didn't know would work, uh, that, that, that do work. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. With a new family of reporters based around the globe investigating the biggest stories in travel. There seems to be a huge divide between tourists and locals. We'll help you get the best out of your gadgets while you're on the road. They love it. Without forgetting to experience the thrill of making memories that will really last a lifetime. Oh! 
There'll be a wealth of additional destination guides and features from the program online. And we are all over social media, so look for us there. Not a natural climber. Woo! Follow us on TV, online and in social media. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading, only on BBC World News. Kind of situation I've been in so many times. You know, I photograph at Anfield, uh, I hang around the streets outside. Um, in Liverpool, it was the culture of the city, you know, and uh, so how could I not? Yeah, it was a very exciting place to go. <laughs> You work out strategies, you know, how, how to work. And in all kinds of situations, whether the, the football or the dock road, and you, you weigh it up, you know, have I got a right to take this picture? What would happen if I take this picture? Um, but at the same time, you know you've got to take it now, or it'll be the moment we'll be gone. I moved to Merseyside in 1978, and on the corner was, was a nightclub called the Chelsea Ridge. I look at all these faces, and I like faces, you know, and all this material, I thought, wow, you know, could I photograph this? I was too shy and scared, you know? It was so noisy, people were drunk, they would think you were a pervert, and so on. I only knew you for a while. I never saw your oh, but if it was easy, if I was invisible, I wouldn't have those kind of tensions, it probably wouldn't be as good, I wouldn't be as involved, maybe. You know? did it really seriously from 84 to 86. I say seriously, three nights a week I'd go in there. A lot of the people I would see on the street would end, you know, they were teenagers or whatever, by 1985 they'd be in the club, and they would know me from the streets, so that made it easier. I knew I wanted to get the emotion and the feeling. I, I was spending my life, my time, looking at them, and they're like looking at each other and uh, looking for love seemed okay as a time. I asked this girl if I could take a picture of her. She was there, stood in the middle of the road, the full moon behind her, the, the water still glistening on the road, and it was late this kind of time of day. It was a long exposure. I handheld it at like quarter of a second. It's not absolutely sharp. A bit underexposed, but it's a picture. So, it's in the book. I just had the idea. I'm here. We've got the book. Let's find out if she's still here. We'll take another picture if she is. You know, what will she think of it? You know? There can't have been that many girls that age around here in '75, can there? It doesn't look like you're born like Anne. It, but it's not Anne, Tom. Because Anne has a short hair. That's short curly hair, Tom. Just and has a shock curly hair. I just ring out. It's not. I mean, yeah. and Anne's hair was straight. It was. She never had a curly. She had a curly in her twenties. Well, that wasn't her twenties. It wasn't. Yeah, 1975. Well, then it could be. Yeah. So she did have curly hair in her twenties. Oh, really? Anne, did you have curly <laughs> hair when you were young? When you were. Did you? 1975, 76. Francis, Anne is saying that's what. Well, maybe it is, Tom. I've never seen you can remember. Curly. Can I put you on to that man, Anne? Never saw him with curly hair. Go on, go on. He's beside me now, and he'd be disappointed if he doesn't talk to the woman in the picture. <laughs> now, he's not looking for an old girlfriend or anything, no. <laughs> no, he's, he's married with two kids. Congrats for finding him. <laughs> <laughs> for finding. There was a full moon in the evening, Anne. Yeah. Hold on. Hi, hello. Yeah, no, it's just... And just made pictures all these years, and suddenly um, lots of things are happening, books are being published. And now that's gone in a book, which has gone all over the whole world. 
So any of the, any of yours in Dublin? Well, they they could come to the opening. Graveyard, and it's uh, it's where my mother's father's family and mother's mother's family were buried. And it's great, you know, to come and visit someone here. You know, you get a sense of other stuff, you know, because it's this is it. Over the years, I've never made any money doing this. Photography is really expensive. You shoot a lot of film, the film's expensive. You've got to pay for the process. You have to make word prints um, if you don't work commercially. So my way of working was to, uh, I taught B-Tech photography. I did that two days a week. I took photographs five days a week, and my wife worked. Um, things were okay, but never made any, any serious money. And many years, I'd make a loss. I mean, partly it's my own fault because I never wanted to finish anything. I wanted to carry on working on something over and over and over again. Kept too many balls up in the air. Never completed the project. People could tell where you're coming from. So if I did it for free, you know, out of kind of love for the situation, the people, that seemed a fair exchange. I'm kind of stealing the pictures in a way, but I'm giving all this stuff back because it'll all be there, you know, one day for those people. So that's the way I worked. I didn't, you know, didn't want to be anybody. When I galleries started representing me and I was selling prints, I couldn't believe it. And here I am now where, you know, lots of recognition, you know, some print sales, shows all over the world. Um, and every, you know, a lot more people are enthusiastic and, and like photography, it's, so it's, it's, it's really good. He didn't treat us with suspicion. We didn't knock his camera out of his hand. And from the Chelsea to the This week in the world of arts, celebrating the life of one of Mexico's most important writers. A new use for bubble wrap. And the small beginnings of large tapestries. But first, LA's Museum of Contemporary Art is holding a retrospective of more than 250 works by Mike Kelly. Working in sculpture, photography and painting, the late artist made a name for himself as a chronicler of American alienation. Highlights include his series of discarded stuffed animals, a model of a sci-fi city and a statue of astronaut John Glenn, covered in broken ceramic. Mexico is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Octavio Paz with an exhibition dedicated to the Nobel Prize winning writer at the Jose Vasconcelos Library. 
It features 200 works, including a number of first editions and photographs of Paz taken throughout his life. Most people can't resist giving it a good squeeze, but for New York-based artist Bradley Hart, bubble wrap is his canvas. He uses a computer to pixelate classic works of art, then injects paint into the corresponding bubbles from behind. He's in the process of finishing pieces for his upcoming show, The Master's Interpreted, Injections and Impressions. Madrid's Prado Museum is exhibiting six oil sketches painted by 17th century Baroque artist Peter Paul Rubens on the subject of the Eucharist. The panels were commissioned by the Infanta Clara Eugenia in around 1625 as blueprints for a series of 20 tapestries. Four of these, loaned to the museum, form a backdrop to the panels. 